live on YouTube. And we're on our site, we can start. Good evening, everyone. This is a Deputy Borough President, Ebony Young, and I will be um, assisting our Borough President, Donovan Richards, who had a scheduling conflict today with our board meeting. I hope everyone on here had a joyous Mother's Day and got to spend some time with their family and their loved ones. I wanna start off by thanking all of the council members, community board chairpersons and Borough Hall staff who are on the Zoom call today. This evening, we are pleased to be joined again by the Bayside Smoke-Free Housing Alliance and the NYC Smoke-Free at Public Health Solutions. Back at our February board, borough board meeting, the board received a presentation that detailed a resolution that calls for landlords of existing and new apartment residential units to transition to a smoke-free apartment policy. The resolution was sent out to everyone last week along with the presentation PowerPoint that was presented in February. We are joined by Phil Konisberg, who is the founder of the Bayside Smoke-Free Housing Alliance. Phil is accompanied by Eileen Miller and Lawrence Saunders. Phil, Eileen, and Lawrence will give a brief summary and overview of the resolution. Then they will answer any questions that the board may have. After the question and answer session, the board can move for the resolution to be adopted and will hold a vote. Welcome, Phil, Eileen, and Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you very much. I welcome uh, everyone on the uh, Zoom call here. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to once again uh, present our mm -hmm. resolution and uh, ask for your support in passing this, uh, which is a, a smoke-free, housing resolution, a voluntary uh, request of all landlords to transition their buildings that are not smoke-free yet to a smoke-free environment. Um, I wanna preface it for those that may not remember from February or weren't present, uh, we're not the first borough to uh, bring this up. The Brooklyn Borough Board passed a similar smoke-free housing resolution several years ago. Uh, at that time, it did not reflect the current COVID-19 health uh, pandemic and the effects that smoking, secondhand smoke has on smokers as well as non-smokers. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions. I just wanna make it clear that this is voluntary. This is not any uh, mandate at this point. And we're hoping that with the borough board support, including the borough president, that landlords who have been hesitant to this point to go smoke free uh, will be encouraged to do that as they can rely on this uh, resolution. Um, I'd like to Hand it over now to Eileen Miller, who is a adult nurse practitioner and also the health chair of Community Board 11. I am, uh, again, I'm the health chair of Community Board 7, but this is strictly a personal request that we're doing this. It's not connected to the Community Board at all. I want to make that clear. And thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Borough President. My name is Eileen Miller. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner. We are concerned citizens and most of us are volunteers. The idea that we don't want government telling us what to do is not the case in privately owned buildings at this time. To me, this is personal. If a diabetic chooses to drink the sugary drink, he or she will only be affected. If a person chooses to smoke a cigarette, all around him or her will be affected by that secondhand smoke. Everyone has the right to live without being affected by someone who chooses to smoke. We know that secondhand smoke contains hundreds of chemicals known to be either toxic 
or carcinogenic. And secondhand smoke carries and causes multiple health issues. I live in a single family home. I am advocating for the people that live in a multiple family dwelling. As a nurse practitioner and as working as a nurse while over 30 years in the hospital, I have seen the devastation of secondhand smoke, including some patients who wound up on ventilators. This has led me to become a patient, an advocate for smoke-free housing. The knowledge that some have no control over shared airspace with those who choose to smoke is very saddening to me. This resolution would include all types of smoke, including marijuana and vaping. Just to clarify, medical marijuana does not come in smoke form. So this would not affect anyone who is prescribed with medical marijuana. Some buildings have stations set up outside of their buildings where people can go and smoke if they choose. I would advise everyone to vote for this resolution for yourself, your neighbors, and your children. Please remember that this is a resolution only and not a law at this time. Thank you for your time. And I hope you will consider what I believe is doing the right thing for our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Is there anyone else? Yes. Uh, Lawrence, mm -hmm. Lawrence, you're on mute. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me introduce uh, Lawrence. Sanders, he's from the New York City House uh, Smoke Free Alliance. Yes, a uh, good day. Thank you, Deputy um, Borough President, and to the Queen's Board just for having us. My name is Lawrence Sanders. I, I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the Borough of Queens for NYC Smoke Free. Uh, we're a program of public health solutions. And we're definitely um, provide advocating and education regarding non-smoking policies in, in New York City. And um, our, we believe that everyone has a right to clean air, to fresh air. And so our job is very important to definitely try to minimize, eradicate smoking in New York City. Um, uh, one of the things that we've noticed throughout this pandemic um, that while New Yorkers continue to spend more time indoors, more than ever before, a lot of, we've been getting so many complaints, residents reporting that they're experiencing a sharp increase in secondhand smoke exposure. So that's some of the things that we've been getting calls consistently and people who are affected with asthma and people who are in breathing apparatuses. Secondhand smoke is infiltrating into their apartments, infiltrating into their breathing areas. There's no ventilation system that a building can put in place to stop secondhand smoke from traveling. So that's not the answer. Um, <clears throat> so what we've done um, at NYC Smoke Free, basically to date, we have assisted property owners and, and property managers to adopt over 147 policies, non-smoking policies. And, um, and that has created smoke-free protection for over 19,000 apartment units in New York City, which impacts over 150,000 New York City residents. Uh, we come today just to provide a, you know, our hope that this resolution would be adopted, um, that so that people can actually, you know, breathe e easier. We know that with the correlation between COVID and those who are smoking, they are, because of COVID does affect the respiratory um, area that, and if you're smoking, secondhand smoke can even exacerbate it and makes, make it more, um, more, just more, uh, just more negative, have a more negative impact on people's health. So we've been getting tons of calls, a lot of complaints about, because people have been home. So they're home, they're smoking more. So we, we implore everyone to hopefully they can, you know, vote to adopt this resolution that will help people to breathe, help people to have a better quality of life of where they're living. It's like living in the building. You wouldn't want somebody blasting music at three o'clock in the morning because why? It would affect you if you're sleeping next door or trying to get sleep. Well, smoking doesn't just affect you in a way music would because I can... I can lose a night's sleep, but then secondhand smoke cause, can cause me to lose my life. 
So we're here today. We just hope that this uh, resolution is adopted. And we thank you. Thank you so much for just bringing this to a vote. And thank you for your time hearing us. Thank you so much, Lawrence. We'll now open the floor up to questions. I already see two. Uh, the first I have Dolores Orr, and then we'll move on to Vincent. Good evening, everyone. So uh, a couple of questions I have and com comments, I guess, also. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my sound off. Um, so it's a recommend, the resolution we're looking at is a recommendation for tobacco. So my first question is, I hope that this is the first step uh, in the process of stopping smoking in uh, multiple dwellings. I feel, and I'm hoping it's being worked on, that any new um, construction should be an automatic requirement that there is no smoking allowed. And certainly if it's affordable housing that they're getting government funding. So I hope there is uh, that process. It's, I know it's tedious and involves a lot of agencies, but I hope it's something we're working towards. Uh, the other thing is the resolution says tobacco and Eileen had mentioned um, for it to include, I don't know if it's a wish or the intent was to include both um, non-medical pot and vaping. And I, in the first sentence of this, it clearly says just um, tobacco. So if somebody could answer those two questions for me, please. Well, well basically, good, so you can go down. Well, I was just gonna say that uh, <clears throat> when we say smoking, it's really smoking of any substance, whether it be tobacco, whether it be marijuana, whether it be you know, vaping, uh, anything that is considered smoking that the remnants, the secondhand smoke or secondhand vapor that will affect other people living in that building is-, is Okay, but Phil, the motion doesn't say that. It opens with tobacco and the now therefore it be resolved to prohibit the use of tobacco and tobacco products in any apartment. It doesn't talk about any other uh, items being smoked. Okay. So are we just voting for tobacco or we're talking I about tobacco? I'm sorry, I think tobacco products, I think uh, marijuana is a tobacco product. It's similar. No. It, no. Okay. Well, no, it's no, it's not. It's it's totally different, and right. and the lady is correct. She's this is Frank Taylor, community board uh, three chairman, and what she's saying is absolutely correct. If you're going to put a, a forth a resolution, the resolution has to be correctly worded. Okay. And tobacco does not get into vaping. It does not get into marijuana. It only says tobacco. I I agree with her totally. Well, so it, it should be changed to all uh, smoking, um, all smoke, all smoking of if, any kind, smoking of any kind. If you go on the city, New York City website where they discuss the smoke, uh, I think it's local law 147, the uh, smoking disclosure uh, policy uh, requirement, the definition for smoking does indicate uh, tobacco as well as uh, marijuana. And I believe there might've been some, or any, or it says something to the effect of any substance. I, I have no problem. Okay, uh, so I, mean, I wanna vote for this, but I can't just, if it's just gonna be tobacco and the intent is for more than that. I, I, I don't think the three of us have any objection to uh, amending that, to be more inclusive or more descriptive of, of what we're trying to prevent, uh, basically uh, secondhand smoke uh, of any substance in, in, in the apartment buildings. Right. I okay, so who's that. gonna fix this so we can vote it or do we have to hold off on it? Yeah, that's a question. Alan, do you wanna jump in here? Right. Sure. Um, Thank you. I, I would be, if, if the board is, uh, would, would allow me to do so, I'm, I'm happy to make amendments um, with an understanding that we would include 
uh, reference to marijuana, non-medical marijuana smoke and uh, vape smoke or, or vape. Um, would the board like to see language before voting on that or would the board be comfortable with voting uh, for this resolution with those proposed changes? We wanna see the language. I would be satisfied with uh, knowing it's gonna be added. So I guess somehow you're gonna to have to take a vote deputy for our president. <laughs> Just by a show of hands, who, who okay. would want could, to could you please use your electronic hand, please, if you can? Um, if you would like to- uh, um... Hold on, uh, let me lower everyone's hands first. Okay. I would prefer we do a roll call just so that it's, the, it's on the record, if that's okay with you, Alan. State what we're doing a roll call on. To see if you prefer to vote. I'll let I'll Alan I'll go hand. Yeah, I think Alan should probably feed off here, so. Right, um, what I would, I think that we can just take a temperature of the room if you'd be prepared to vote tonight or we want to hold off for um, another month. So how about if you are willing to vote for the resolution tonight with the understanding that it will be um, amended to make reference to non-medical marijuana smoke and uh, vapor, um, please raise your hand now. Okay, so I'm only seeing three. Can you repeat uh, that? I have a bridge to sell you. You can't ask me to vote on something I can't see. That, Vinny, that's I, I fine. Then that you're just opposed. I think, okay. I think that that's Devoting. the view of the board. If if I'm reading the temperature of the room right now, that's perfectly fine. Can okay. you restate it? The question. So the question would be to vote in favor of the resolution as presented, with an amendment that it would include reference to non-medical marijuana smoke and uh, vapor. Um, because that appears to be the consensus of the board. The question is whether that language should be prepared ahead of time or uh, now. Um, so if you would be prepared to vote on that tonight, uh, please raise your hand. Am I fair to say that we don't have a vote? <laughs> it, it looks like it. Um, I am happy to either revise this and then recirculate it to the borough board in anticipation of a vote uh, next month. Uh, I, I actually, I, I agree with Benny here that, that we wanna make sure that we know precisely what we're voting on and we don't do this on the fly. So uh, I still I, have to give my comments. Please, please do. Yeah, the, the discussion do. is in order, but I just, uh, the discussion of whether to have a vote tonight, I think is, okay. please Benny. So if I may express my comments, as I said in the past, this is that slippery slope uh, that we're sliding on. And Dolores and everyone else, a co-op or a condo is a private home. And yes, they often are financed or paid for with federal loans. So it's no different than a private house. So as I stated before, the slippery slope is no good. And I would vote against it totally. Thank you so much, Vinny. We appreciate that. Any more questions? Gene? Uh, thank you, my, uh, Deputy Borough President. Um, I, I just should just ask one uh, <clears throat> thing uh, on your case. If we could get the chairs to put their name as chair, what, what it is. Because when you ask for who was voting, we have quite a new few chairs, and I don't know who the new chairs are. So if we could ask our, our overseer over at the Borough Hall to put their numbers in it would be appreciative. Um, yes, thank you. I, I have to thank Phil for the work that he's done. And you have to understand, Phil has gone back to 2014. Um, I did not vote for this on my board, um, it, but it won anyhow. It was an 18 to 17 vote that we had. And a lot of discussions. I, I spoke to him today about it and I have problems with the, uh, the Queen's resolution. Um, the first thing I have is the secondhand smoke issue. Um, if we're asking for smoke free, why are we hounding away for secondhand smoke? Smoke free means there's no smoke in the building. So why are we reiterating and pounding away at it? So that's the first thing that bothers me. I, I think that the, whole, the last second to the last paragraph where you were making reference to tobacco and tobacco products, the things such as units and other such units, blah, 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 secondhand smoke, I wouldn't vote for it with that section being in there. 
The second item I have is when you talk about smoked seepage, we're going to worry about tobacco products. Then what about all the other people that are cooking in the building and all the curry and the and the garlic and all the other stuff that comes up through the building? We don't seem to worry about that, but some people don't like curry and, and stuff, and some people don't like garlic, and we have them seeping through the building. So, you know, when you say seepage, it creates a big problem. I understand the smoke-free is smoke-free is smoke-free, then that means there should be no seepage, period. So I think that needs to be clarified, and we're not clarifying. We're just hounding away at words to put into a resolution. The second thing I have to tell you is I'm not in favor of this thing because I think that the people that smoke have a right. We've taken everybody else's rights, but we fail to remember that uh, smokers have a right. It's very hard for somebody that smoke to quit smoking. It is very hard. It's like an alcoholic that won't stop drinking. It's like a drug addict that won't stop. We help them out, but we don't banish them to the four winds. And making them go outside is not an acceptable answer to me. If they want to change the thing and say that the developer should put a room in, in the building to accommodate smokers that will be vented outside, that's fine with me. I could live with that. But at least we're taking their concerns in here. I, I find it very apprehensible in this day and age that what's good for one is, is going to be the answer for everybody. We do have smokers, and it's not an easy thing to break. And I do understand the, the ramifications of how smoking is bad for me, but that's the choice of a smoker that wants to continue smoking, and I understand that. So I could not vote for this resolution if we don't put something in to protect the smokers to say that the, the developer has to put a room in that will be used by them, by anybody that wants to smoke, and it's vented outside so it doesn't affect the building people. That I can live with. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jeannie. Maury? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, thank you. I um, I just want to say that I am in full support of, of this resolution. Um, I think for me, I totally understand uh, Chair Kelty's viewpoint, and I do believe that if things are uh, legal, then people should be allowed to do them in the privacy of their own home. But it's that old saying that they they. Um, that then nobody can figure out who to credit with, but my right to swing my arm ends when it touches your nose. And, you know, I live in a um, pre-war building. We have 45 apartments in the building. I can smell all kinds of smoke in my building. I have asthma. I have neighbors with asthma. Um, and it's, it's not fun. And one of the reasons I've mentioned this at the previous meeting. My father was a pipe smoker my whole life. And as a kid, that secondhand smoke affected me. And I have allergies and asthma as a result. Um, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, that little baby down the hall from you, that baby, that child or that neighbor who has asthma or other issues, they didn't, they shouldn't be um, forced to move apartments or to try to find another apartment because someone else wants to engage in an activity that negatively affects their health. Again, if your home, you know, if you have a single home and there's no other houses around and your, your smoke, you know, is, is going to be contained in your home, fine. But, you know, we live in these buildings and I, I understand this point about curry. Well, that's an offensive smell maybe to somebody. Somebody else may, may not find it offensive, but there's been no studies that say that curry is going to cause lung cancer or other sicknesses. And I think that to me is the, the key difference. We're talking about uh, the health of your neighbors and um, we know from the data and the statistics that are out there in the studies that secondhand smoke does cause health issues in people. And it not only, and, and they should not be victims of somebody else's uh, choice. Right. That's you. all I have to say. Thank you, Maury. Uh, Lawrence, do you have your hand up? Or is that from the previous? Okay. Are there any more questions? If you have your hand up and I'm missing it, please just chime in. Okay. We will move the motion. I'm sorry, Deputy oh, VP. Yes. I just, uh, my second question had been, and we got on, off the topic, mm -hmm. is, uh, is there any group or legislators working on an attempt on new construction so that when people are going into the building, they know uh, to have regulations automatically in place? If anyone can answer that. The only 
legislation that I know that might still be on the books that goes back nine years was then council member Donovan Richards proposing legislation for any city subsidized uh, construction of multiple housing, that that would be smoke free. But um, I think that lived its its life and hasn't been around very long. It hasn't been around any longer. Okay, thank you. May I add, um, we had, uh, when we first started this initiative many years ago, we had gone to some sites um, and requested, and we also went to um, Representative Constantinas, uh, he's no longer uh, a council person, about the issue of trying to get new buildings to make smoke-free um, something that they would be uh, happy to do. And they were going to move forward with that, but uh, just a few of them at that time. Uh, I just wanted to just mention one other thing about the, you said about the, the children. Uh, so if you live in an apartment and uh, you don't know who's behind that door, and if it's a little baby with tiny lungs and the smoke goes under the door and goes into that apartment, yes, it also affects that little child. And that's nothing to do with um, that person. It's the one who's smoking. And is that fair? Uh, one other thing, like you did mention about the curry, I have not seen any reports that curry or any other spices cause any kind of lung or problems, um, medical problems for the general population or otherwise. Uh, and just one other thing, I have a mortgage on my house. I know I go through a bank and you know I didn't realize that it's a federally backed mortgage, but even still, I'm, as long as I'm paying my mortgage, the federal government isn't gonna tell me what to do or is not gonna be um, saying anything about uh, smoking in my home. Thank you, uh, Eileen. Maury? Yeah, sorry, I was so, so caught up in sharing my opinion, and you know what they say about opinions, that I forgot to ask the actual question. The, the resolution we have here, it's also, it's, I just want to clarify, when it, it's up for the, the landlords to decide if they want to do this, right? It's not yes. mandatory? Yes, not mandatory at all. It's up to the co-op. It's up to the landlord of the building. And that's the way, you know, it's up. It's a choice that the building tenants will make. It's so not something that's going to be mandated or the landlord. So then we, we could look at this as an issue of, uh, of freedom and private property rights. If they own that building, they should have the right to have their own rules. Right. right. Yes. If the individual owns the co-op or the condo. And they have their own private rights. Well, actually, in North, 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 North Shore Towers, um, that is a, 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 one of the largest co-ops in, actually, I believe, the country. And they all got together and they all voted that they wanted smoke-free in their buildings. The only place you can smoke is on their golf course. And um, that whole... Um, Co-op is all mm -hmm. smoke-free in your apartment. Cannot Vol smoke. Voluntarily not mandated because you cannot tell someone what to do with their own property. Right. And they all decided they did not want to be having smoke-free in their apartments. So the whole complex is smoke-free. Okay. Thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Jean. And thank you. Um, yes. Thank you, Deputy Borough President. Let's just get a little clear thing here. Don't so forget the caveat. The only thing I didn't say that you, when you smell curry or or what you call it, uh, garlic, it was affecting your cancerous problems. What I'm saying is, it's irritating you to your sinuses. It's irritating to people who have asthma. It does affect the, it does affect those people. So yes, you may not be dying of cancer, but I've went in the fire department. I can't tell you how many times. That I responded to people's apartments, and because the strong odors are coming outside of their windows, coming into them, because they're on the 14th floor, and a restaurant was cooking below, that they were getting the odors of everything that was coming up the shaft. So yes, it does reduce cancer, but if you have asthma, it will trip your asthma and everything else. So let's be a little clear what you're defending and what you're telling me that. But I yes, I just mentioned the statement that does cause problems with other people in the building. That's what I'm saying. 
Okay, you, you clarified that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you I, I apologize. I'm sorry. Deputy, can I just ask a question? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Frank Taylor again, Queens uh, uh, Board 3 Chair. Um, instead of going back and forth like this, I, I think the, the whole gist of this is that this needs to be flushed out a little bit more as an idea and things need to be put down on paper as far as this being an idea that we can vote on or not. Going back and forth doesn't help anyone no. um, as far as Curry or whatever. Listen, you know, we're all here to solve a problem. This is a voluntary thing. Uh, I, I, I personally think it's good for everyone not to smoke, but I'm a non-smoker and I'm just one opinion. But, you know, guys, back and forth, let's just, uh, you know, try to flush this out a little bit better. And uh, let's come back, if we can, humbly next month and figure it out, if we can. Thank you, Deputy. Thank I appreciate you, that. Thank you. So we will move this resolution to our next meeting. Um, Heather, do you have any comments before we go? And then we'll, we'll move on to the next agenda item. The only thing I have to share is that one of the things that came up in a discussion with my executive committee, you know, is, is partly that this, this does seem to sort of favor, it can sound sort of strange coming from someone in CB6, but this does seem to favor people who have the capacity and the financial capacity to be single family homeowners to do as they wish, as they should in their own home. Whereas if you are in a multifamily dwelling um, or you have to be in a multifamily dwelling because of your income level, this does seem to penalize you and give you a, a bit of a limit to your freedom should your landlord so choose to then impose this. And as somebody who has had tons of family members um, who have struggled with smoking on and off most of their life, mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate the struggle that was communicated tonight from one of our members as to how hard this is. Um, and I would also, um, also so sort of echo what Frank says. I think we've spent an awful lot of time as this board on this issue. I think this is our second meeting. And I think then next will be our third meeting on this. I just think that knowing and looking at my community, I'm sure we all feel the same. We've got 10,000 other things that we need to be looking at as well. So Ebony, to that point, I'll shut up. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We appreciate that. So we'll, like I said, we say that we'll move the resolution to our next meeting and move on to the next agenda item. For our next agenda item, we will review and receive a presentation from the Department of Youth and Community Development on their Neighborhood Advisory Boards and 2022 Community Needs Assessment. Tonight's presentation will highlight the importance of New York City's 41 Neighborhood Advisory Boards, which assist DYCD in allocating roughly $30 million in federal community service block grants funding to fight the effects of poverty through social service programming. DYCD will conduct its triannual community needs assessment where they hope to hear from New Yorkers from every corner of the city on the service gaps they experience in their lives and communities. I would now like to welcome Anita Antonetti, who is the Senior Director of Strategic Outreach for DYCD's Neighborhood Advisory Board Unit. The Neighborhood Advisory Board Unit works with community residents who advise DYCD on programs and services that are needed in their communities. Anita is also joined by NAB liaison, uh, David Aguilar-Loro. Welcome, Anita and David. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Bureau President. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here. Good evening. Um, I hail from the Bronx, but I am a lifelong Mets fan, so let's go Mets. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, so the Department of Youth and Community Development uh, is the community action agency for the city of New York, which means that it is um, it gets uh, federal funding to alleviate the, the effects of poverty in New York City. And this is a program that has been around since 1964 when Congress um, enacted the Economic Opportunity Act. Um, and the, that act had a provision in it that said uh, members of the community that will be receiving services have to have a voice in what services are, are um, are given to their community. So with that in mind, we, uh, have, we, we have now 58 years later, we have the neighborhood advisory boards. 
So this slide is just the, uh, the, the mission of the, of the agency. It's the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, again, invests in a network of community-based organizations and programs to alleviate the effects of poverty and to provide opportunities for all New Yorkers and communities to flourish. Uh, the vision statement then says, we strive to improve the quality of life of New Yorkers by collaborating with local organizations and investing the talents and assets of our communities to help them develop, grow, and th thrive. Now, DYCD does not give direct services. We contract them out to community-based organizations. Next slide, please. So what is the neighborhood advisory board as I alluded to first, they, it's made up of 12 community members who uh, identify the program needs for specific areas where they reside. And um, those areas where they reside are called neighborhood development areas. And the way we uh, create neighborhood development areas is it has to be 20% um, or more of the population has to meet the federal poverty guidelines. And we get this information from uh, the US Census and the American Community Survey that is done every single year. So every time we have a new request for proposals that is, uh, that is going to be published, we take the, la the previous three years of information to see which um, communities are at 20% or more of poverty. Uh, Queens happens to have eight different neighborhood development areas. Uh, next slide, please. And as I said in the beginning, it's all part of what's called a national initiative of community action. And we, we have now, these 58 years later, it's called the Community Services Block Grant, which is given to the state of New York. And as uh, the Deputy Provost President says, New York City gets about $30 million. It's more like a, almost $32 million right now of, of that money every year to run these programs. Uh, New York City, is divided into 41 neighborhood development areas. And each area has the group of re residents that advise these DYCD on which programs their community needs. And the way, the way we do that is through a community needs assessment that uh, the state requires us to do every uh, three years. Um, the law actually had, and the bottom uh, bullet says, um, uh, uh, required that we have uh, maximum feasible participation, which means that community members need to uh, have uh, involvement in deciding which programs are needed in their community. Next slide. So here is Queens. As I said before, Queens has eight boards and um, it's a little hard to see because everything is so small, but they, these are the maps of the different areas. And as you can see here, all the neighborhoods that are, are represented. And this um, graph show, I mean, this uh, spreadsheet shows the current members and the vacant seats. And what we're here for is to ask for your help in filling those vacant, those vacant seats. Now, we, as I said before, the, the boards are 12 members can be on the board. Half of them are directly appointed by DYCD and the other half are recommended by local elected officials. And where you can see the vacant seats, the appointing elected officials, they're not actually DYCD appoints them, but uh, the elected officials make the recommendation. So that's, that's where you can see all, all of this. And then on the bottom are the maps of the neighborhood development area. Next slide. 
Now, this is the results from the last community needs assessment that we did, which was in 2019. And it's a little hard to see as well, but uh, I could tell you these were the top three uh, categories in each, um, in each neighborhood development area. And Queens is on the right. And I can tell you by color, the green is the top priority, the blue is the second priority, and the purple is the third priority. So for Queens, most of it was in basic needs, which is food, shelter, uh, healthcare, and, and uh, yeah, base, basic needs. Uh, uh, the, the second one, um, you can see his education, employment, and uh, some of them were even in uh, support for special populations were like seniors and veterans and disabled populations. Uh, next slide. So where does this uh, community needs assessment information go? It uh, identifies the resources and gaps and needs. And there's a menu of programs that DYCD develops for each NDDA um, neighborhood development area that aligns with the community needs. Uh, it informed program designs and agency-wide policy. And DYC also shares the data with other city agencies. So we do human services. So if there comes up that healthcare is, is a, a big need, we will share that information with the Department of Health and, and with health and hospitals. And hopefully they will be able to put a program together to, um, to meet that need. Next slide. Okay, the Neighborhood Advisory Board, this is the cycle of their involvement. Um, it, as I said before, that they, they help with administering the community needs assessment every three years. They go out into their community and, um, and, and uh, distribute surveys and collect the information. When we have a request for proposals come out for funding, they evaluate the data from the community needs assessment and they set the program priorities based on the information that has come out of the needs assessment in that order, the top priority, second, third, fourth, depending on how much money each neighborhood development area uh, receives. They also get to read proposals that are submitted by the community-based organizations that will provide those services and they select the best out of, out of the group. But uh, more than that, they're active community uh, residents and we do discuss and look for resolutions for other problems that may not be in DYCD's purview. Um, but we discuss all of it. They meet four times a year and the minimum age is 16 like the community boards. And we're looking for youth uh, to come and be part of this. This is a good entryway for civic engagement for youth. And uh, this other circle that's on the right is our DYCD, Discover DYCD, um, where you can look at, um, you can search for any program from across the city. There's two programs there. They're not the neighborhood development area programs, but we have our after school programs and we also have um, the summer youth employment program as well. Next slide, please. So this is what we're, we're asking is if you can help us to get uh, members on the, the neighborhood advisory board. The only caveat there is, is that uh, applicants or members cannot work for DYCD or have a household member that works for DYCD. Also, if they work for an elected official um, and live in the same neighborhood development area where that elected official has a seat, they would not be eligible to serve on the board. But uh, community board members can also serve on, on the NAB because uh, it's, it's not a conflict of interest. 
uh, we have members from all, all walks of life. Um, and we would like to have full boards, especially now that we're going to do our community needs ass assessment again, because uh, many hands make light work. So on the slide is our, our contact information. My colleague David has been putting information into the chat. And um, and I believe this is the last, is this the last slide, Dave? <laughs> and I have yes. to apologize yes, because uh, my colleague Candace uh, Julian was going to make this presentation, but she got called away today. So I am stepping in in her place. So I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anita. Any questions? Okay, I'm seeing none. Okay. Okay, so, thank you so much for making the presentation and I'm hoping people will support yes. and some folks your way. We have some questions now. Uh, we do, <laughs> Betty, I see Betty. Sorry about that, Betty. <laughs> I'm not being fast enough. Just a question. Uh, on, on your map, mm -hmm. so when I looked at the uh, map that comes down into the area that Board 10 represents, uh -huh. of Community Board 9, and you have a piece of Community Board 10 in Ozone Park. The other part of Ozone Park, you've left out of it. And then when I looked over to the side, the elected officials that are involved in the nominations, none of whom I have any issues with, but don't represent those most of those areas. For example, uh, uh, Congressman Meeks does mm. not represent that whole section of Ozone Park. No, but he, uh, he represents a part of it. Only a portion of it. There are two other senators. Okay, it's based on the population that is uh, twenty percent or more uh, meeting the federal poverty guidelines. That, what... Okay, so then the elected officials, their districts are looked at, and the one that has the most uh, population in poverty is the one that uh, gets the seat on the board. So it's not on any district lines. It's not on community district lines. It, it used to be. When it first started, it was community district uh, lines, but it's not. The population of poverty shifts every every year. Uh, so when every time we do this, our maps are are different. So and and that's how the the uh, the elected officials who have a seat on the board are chosen. It's based on the population of poverty in their district. In that in that section of of the city, that, that another elected official who may not have a seat on the board, right? And they recommend people. From oh no! Yeah, we take recommendations from everybody. We ask all of the elected officials. Quite a to, few elected officials that encompass that area. Sure, they can make recommendations, and we will put them on. We will put the person on the board. Uh, we do uh, interview all of the applicants to make sure that everything, we have their correct address and contact information. And um, it's a two, um, there's two, three year terms. So it's uh, six years that they can serve up to six years on the board. Um, and I was assuming that those were the only elected officials that could nominate people. Oh, no, no, no. We, in fact, we, we ask people all, you know, we have uh, uh, elected officials that we ask, you know, do you know anybody else who lives in this neighborhood? And we, you know, and we'll put one in your seat, but we'll put the others in a, in a different seat. Or we ask them to talk to each other also. Can you tell your, your colleague to recommend this person? So we, we, we're very creative in our ways that we get our board members. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Betty, and thank you, Anita. Um, yeah. Lynette. Hi, good evening. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just only wanted to ask, um, how do you uh, locate the current members? How, how do you uh, find out who is serving at this time? Um, because I see where you have some vacant seats. Yes. 
are filmed so, already. So who, who are those people and how do we learn about who they are? They, they're, they're on our website. It's nyc.gov forward slash DYCD. And if you go to the tab that says get involved, you'll be able to see who's on the board right now. Okay. All Thank right. you so much. And uh, Lynette is uh, one of our newest representatives on our citywide board, the, the Community Action Board. She's rep she represents uh, the council speaker, Adams, on there. Very nice to uh, hear. Thank you. Thank yes, you, yes. Thank you, Anita. Any additional questions? Seeing none. I want to thank everyone for their amazing presentations today. And as stated, um, we will move the resolution to the next meeting. Thank you to the Queensboro President's Office staff who are so diligently working in the background, helping uh, throughout these times. And uh, want everybody to have a very safe and pleasant evening.